Tonight, I want to speak briefly on homes that need repairing. James Garner, the film star in the Saturday Evening Post recently said that he remembers many times when someone picked him up and dusted him off. And we all need that, and we need that kind of companionship that only comes many times within marriage. Justice Sandra O'Connor, one of the Supreme Court justices, told a young couple about to be married, here's what she said, and I quote, Marriage is the single most important event in the life of two people in love. Marriage is the foundation of the family, mankind's basic unit of society, she said, the hope of the world and the strength of our country. There are more articles on the home and marriage and the family than ever before. But something is happening to our homes. Homes are breaking. Divorce rates are the highest in history, much higher than many other countries of the world. God has rules and regulations and laws concerning marriage. He's laid down the responsibility of the members of the home. First, there's the husband. The modern husband today is frustrated, the average husband, we're told, by some of our writers, unsure of his role. He's beginning to suffer an inferiority complex. Now, I haven't met many of those, but that's what I've heard on the television. They've often been pushed out of their place, and some doctors say, that it's the greatest cause of impotence. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If a man loved his wife as Christ loved the church, then that wife would have little difficulty in adapting to her husband. Do you love your wife as Christ loved the church? How did Christ love the church? Look at the church with its divisions, its sins, all the problems and failures of the church, all of us the way we are with all of our mistakes and failures and sins, Christ loves us. You ought to love your wife that much. You're not going to find a perfect woman. There is no such creature. My wife is as near to it as anyone. I heard about one fella, and the minister was in the pulpit preaching, and he said, has anybody in this congregation ever heard of a perfect man? And one little weasel-faced man stood up in the rear, raised his hand, and he said, yes, sir, I have. And the minister was startled, and he said, who? He said, my wife's first husband must have been perfect. Yes, we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And I'd have some suggestions. You know, wives or women like the little things count with them. Show your love. Show your love. And then the wife on this business of submitting, the scripture says in Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another, one to another in the fear of the Lord. There are certain things I submit to my wife. There's certain things she submits to me. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The church is to return that love. The husband is to love the wife as Christ loved the church, so the wife is to return the love to the husband. Ephesians 5.22 should be translated, Wives, adapt yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. 1 Peter 3.1 in the Living Bible reads, Wives, Fit in with your own husband's plans. For then if they refuse to listen when, they talk, when you talk to them about the Lord, they will be won by your respectful, pure behavior. Your actual lives will speak to them better than any words. In other words, don't always be nagging your husband. Even if your husband happens not to be a believer, don't nag at him. Just live the life in front of him and let the Holy Spirit produce the fruit in your life and that'll have more effect on him than you're talking to him and nagging at him. I don't know whether that's the ladies or the men. <laughs> Wives and... If Colossians 3.18, adapt yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Titus 2.4, the older women are to teach the young women to be sober and to love their husbands. And I take that word sober pretty literally now after reading an article on how alcoholism is growing so rapidly among women today. 
Wives, Titus 2, 5, ought to be discreet, chaste, and keepers at home. Notice keepers at home. Unless there's a real financial need, that is her first responsibility. It's all right for a white wife to work before children and after they're grown. Now, there are exceptions, I know, where the wife has to work in these days. But if the wife does not lead this kind of a life, the scripture says her prayers can be hindered and the word of God can be blasphemed. Only Christ can help you to be the kind of mother and wife you ought to be. Now, suppose you have already been divorced. What should you do? Well, you cannot unscramble eggs. Go on from where you are. Surrender to the Lord totally and completely. Ask him to forgive the mistakes and the failures and the sins of that first marriage. And then ask him to lead you. And if you're the innocent party, you have a right to be remarried. And if you have doubts about it, go see some, your clergyman or some Christian advisor to help you and counsel you. But don't let it hang over you like a pall all of your life and destroy your life. Ask God to forgive. Now a word to parents. I would like to say this to parents. Take time with your children. That's one of the regrets I have. We have five children and 15 grandchildren. I'd certainly hate for these 15 grandchildren to grow up and say they never knew their grandfather. So when I leave Boston, I'm going to be with six of them that next day and give the commencement address for where two of them are graduating from high school. And I'm going to spend three or four days with them. Then I want to try to get to every one of the families and spend several days this year with each one of our families. And ye fathers, bring them up tenderly in the training and counsel of the Lord. Don't overcorrect your children. They may grow up feeling inferior and frustrated. Train up a child in the way he should go, not the way he necessarily wants to go, but the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart. I believe that you have every right to claim that promise if you've reared your child the best you can before God and you have prayed for him and he goes astray and gives you trouble. Don't you go around carrying a guilt because he reaches the age of accountability in which he stands before God himself as an adult, a moral adult. But when he's old, if you keep praying and keep faithful, he'll not depart. There'll be a day when he comes back. I've seen it time after time. Oh yes, sometimes we have to discipline our children. Suit the discipline to the offense and the temperament of each child. Now the responsibility of children, of course, young people here, is to obey your parents in the Lord unless it interferes with your personal relationship with Christ. And we're always to honor our parents. Honor thy father and thy mother. Even if it, they're not honorable, we're to honor them. That doesn't mean we always obey them, but we're to honor them. Always honor your father and your mother. We, are, we have friends at the Mayo Clinic. He's one of the greatest doctors, I think, in the world. He was President Lyndon Johnson's doctor. And he's had 43 years of happy Christian marriage. I don't know a finer Christian home in the world than Dr. Jim Kane's home, where we often go. 44 years of medical practice at the Mayo Clinic. And he's written, every worthwhile medical history requires knowledge and understanding of a patient's family. Thus, it requires a marital history in order to understand the physical well-being of a person. And he makes several suggestions. I want you to listen to what a medical doctor at the Mayo Clinic said. He said, first, vocally and frequently declare your love to your spouse. A discreet pat or a squeeze of the arm or just a look can secretly say, I love you. Second, make your spouse happy. This is your most important job and function in life. His or her happiness is more important than your monetary related job. And he said, don't be afraid to be silly with each other in your thoughts and dreams and otherwise. You can't be silly and let yourself go with anyone else. 
Thirdly, never even look at another man or another woman. Fourthly, never do anything that you anticipate will be fun without including your spouse. Fifthly, plan and do extra and unexpected things together. Sixthly, if away from home, contact your spouse every day with a postcard, a letter, or a telephone call. Seventhly, never criticize your spouse to others. Save your best manners and your greatest consideration for your family. Eighthly, plan and arrange time alone with your spouse. Get away from the children and friends for a date each week and perhaps a weekend every month. And nine, beware of money problems. It's not my money or your money, but our money. Tenthly, never compete with your spouse. Never try to make your spouse jealous. His or her success is yours. Delight in it. Eleventhly, go to church and read the Bible and pray each night together. Don't ever go to bed at night without holding hands and praying together. You say, Billy, I wish that was all true in our lives. It could be with Christ.